translated and recorded by Daniel Medvedev at Rec Square Studios, Moscow. Lectures on the Rain. Hello, everybody. This is Lectures on the Rain. Today we have a special occasion. The whole country is celebrating the 200-year anniversary of the Battle of Borodino. Putin himself visited the Borodino field, and just today the whole city center was blocked off for traffic because of an honorary prayer in the Cathedral of Christ the Savior. I barely made it to work, not to mention today's guests. So is there anything to celebrate, and what was this famous battle all about? We'll try and answer these questions and figure out the myths and the truths. Here to answer these questions, we have a true specialist. Our guest is Yevgeny Ponosenkov, a historian and author of a monograph on the Battle of Borodino and the War of 1812. Let's begin. Lectures on the Rain Good day, my dear friends. I'm very happy to see that you were able to get through the thick columns of the so-called honorary prayer. So, I'll ask all of you to cheer up a bit, because I understand the weather's terrible, yesterday was Saturday, I barely got any sleep myself, but... Noblesse oblige. So, first of all, we must all agree that, of course, in the short period of one hour, I won't be able to debunk all the myths or tell you about all the documents or sources. That's impossible. Today's genre simply does not imply this. I'll refer you to my own works and the works of others. Most of them are already digitalized and can be found online. That's first. Second, I believe that the primary goal of today's lecture is to answer two fundamental questions, which are essential for understanding the Battle of Borodino. First, how in the world did the French, who were the allies of the Russians, come all the way from Paris to Moscow? How did that happen? And second, why do we so pompously celebrate the defeat of the Russians at the Battle of Borodino, a battle where we first retreated and then surrendered our ancient capital? Why did we retreat? Why did we leave it behind? These are the main questions we'll try to answer today. First of all, I believe that we should all dive into the atmosphere and get a sense of the setting of that era. Because today, it all seems a little operetta-like, like something out of a comic book. And that wasn't quite the case. I want you to feel the difference. When Napoleon corresponded with Alexander I, from the peace treaty in Tilsit to the War of 1812, he was literally writing from the future into the past. Because, as you may know, the Russian and the French had different calendars, what we call today the old and the new styles. So if the French crossed the Neiman River on the 24th of June, in Russia, it was still the 12th. And this had an influence on all the events. Because when the French crossed the Neiman, Napoleon, in a way, went back to the future. And in this future, he saw that there were poor roads and an economic system without free commerce and stores. As you know, on their way to Russia, the French purchased provisions with golden Napoleons. In Russia, this was harder, because there was a trade fair system and serfdom, which meant one time a year in Novgorod, one time a year in another city. It wasn't that easy. Second, when we watch movies dedicated to the Patriotic War of 1812, made on Mosfilm and Lenfilm Studios, we hear the Russian side speaking Russian and the French side speaking either Russian or French. That wasn't the case. Because, of course, the Grand Armée spoke in many languages. But the Russian army spoke in just as many languages. And the one used primarily for speaking and writing by the officers and generals was, of course, French. This was even the case for those who were not French, but German. They say the French army was called the Army of 20 Tongues. All right, let's look at the Russian army. One of the generals was Leonti Leontievich Benningsen, which wasn't his real name. His actual name was Levin August von Benningsen, born in Hanover. I'll remind you that Hanover, Hanover is an ancient German city which 
before and during the times of Napoleon, was under the protectorate of the English crown. So, as we see, the head of the Russian command, a cavalry general, did not change his citizenship and remained a subject of the King of England. And that's not the whole truth, because when Napoleon entered Hanover, which he did because due to the continental blockade, he needed to rid this territory from English goods, it turns out that the head of the Russian command was actually a subject of Napoleon. This doesn't mean he served Napoleon, but legally, this embarrassment existed. The man responsible for troop disposition at Bordino was Karl Toll, not entirely Russian. We'll mention him a bit later. From the very start of the war, the Russian army was commanded by Bagration, a man born not in Russia, but in Georgia. On the other hand, we had Barclay de Tolly, who was of course not Mikhail Bogdanovich, though he was officially Mikhail Bogdanovich, though he was born Mikhail Andres, also from a bloodline of German, Courland and Scottish barons. This does not mean that he was a bad soldier. He was a good soldier. He was a professional. But for him this was... You know how today, on Russia's main propaganda TV channels, some people tear their shirts open in the name of the anniversary budget, which is 2 billion 400 million rubles. For this money, our dear TV hosts tear open their shirts in the name of... Speaking of language, did you know that the Russian which I'm using now didn't even exist in 1812? If you read any historical materials or documents from that time, you won't be able to understand about 20 to 30 percent of the information. That's because the Russian literary language was created by Pushkin, who was not completely Russian. What's more, his language was a translation from French, the phrase structure was French, and a large part of the vocabulary was French. So when they ask me, are you serious about what you say? I respond, more than serious. Let's remember the poet Svetaeva. She loved to quote Vyazimsky, one of the greatest Russian translators, who used to say, there are no words in Russian for naive and serious. To solve this problem, he just took them from French. They're French words. In 1812, there was no word for serious in the Russian language. Kutuzov spoke the word, but only because he was speaking French. The Russian high command spoke French, German, and English. The soldiers spoke in a Russian that we don't use today. Today's Russian was created by Russia's genius Pushkin, who, as I've already mentioned, wasn't entirely Russian. One more detail. Look at Alexander I. All of our TV channels shout out in one voice. On one side there's Napoleon, not a Russian, an infidel, sometimes even called the Antichrist, and on the other, Alexander, the Russian Tsar. And they pronounced the word Russian with such a fervent R. Speaking of his Russianness, it's quite the story. I don't even want to say anything without supporting myself with documents. I'll read you this story out loud because the truth is, Alexander was just as Russian as Napoleon. Because his father, Pavel I, was the son of Catherine II, born in Germany. And who was Catherine II? Sophie Frederick August von Anhalt Serbst Dornburg. And the father of Pavel I, Alexander's grandpa, Peter III, Karl Peter Ulrich, Duke of the Holstein Gottorp. For your information, if you so much as open not even a monograph but just Wikipedia, you'll see that by that time the Romanov dynasty was simply a story fed to the common folk. Actually, in 1812, we were being ruled by the holstein hotorp dynasty, belonging to the Romanov house, a name that was added for convenience. So we were ruled by Germans. I don't see much difference between the Germans and Bonaparte. By the way, Napoleon, which translates into Russian as him on the field, Napoleon, sounds more Russian than Holstein Hottorp. Not to mention Alexander's mother, another story in itself. Sophia, Maria, Dorothea, Augusta Luisa von Württemberg. There's also Alexander's wife, Luisa Marie August of Baden. To be fair, I must say that they weren't very close. Both of her children died in early childhood, and both were from 
lovers. One from Alexei Ochotnikov and the other from Adam Czartoryski. Adam Czartoryski was the Minister of Foreign Affairs during the reign of Alexander I. He first took part in the Kostyushko uprising, then made a child with Alexander's wife, Louisa of Baden, and then he took part in the November uprising or the Polish-Russian War of 1830. He became the president of the provisional government in the 1830s and then immigrated to and died in France. There was a short period when Russia's Minister of Foreign Affairs was a man named Rumantsev, and then for 40 years it was Nesselrodi. Not only wasn't he Russian, but he also failed to learn the language in his 40 years on the job. That's who was in charge of Russia's foreign policy. That's who was in charge. Levin August Gottlieb Theophil von Benningsen. Karl Willem von Toll was in charge of stationing the troops. Kutuzov moved the army corps. And Alexander I, the Russian Tsar, in command. And what about the Russian people? The peasants. As Pushkin wrote, oh silly folly Russian people. The Russian people shed their blood for all this. Speaking of the folly Russian people, this was not a phrase uttered by someone from the US State Department. These are the words of Russian genius Pushkin, though I repeat, he was not entirely Russian. But if we go further back in time, even Kutuzov wasn't Russian, because the name Kutuz had Turkish roots. And if we take the history of his family, they came from the Prussians in the times of Alexander Nevsky. And of course, just like all the other wealthy people of his time, Kutuzov spent his vacations in Germany. So, as we've figured out, Alexander I was just as Russian as Napoleon. But maybe he was Orthodox Christian. He was indeed Orthodox Christian. Though I'm not very sure how the rules of Christianity go along with the murder of one's father. As you know, Pavel I understood that France was a natural ally. We didn't have any common geopolitical problems, as we did with Austria, Prussia or England none with France. As soon as he allied with France, he was murdered. The money provided by England through Lord Consulate Charles Whitworth and his mistress Zhiruptsova, who was a relative of the Zubovs, also Orthodox Christian aristocrats. These Orthodox aristocrats murdered the anointed Orthodox sovereign Pavel. And what of Alexander I? We must give him credit. He said, if possible, it would be preferable that you don't kill him. But that's utter hypocrisy, because how could you remove an emperor without killing him? And so we had an Orthodox Christian parricide, after which the Holy Synod, an official Russian ministry, anointed the Tsar. Let's talk a bit more about Orthodox Christianity in that day and age, even though I'm sure nothing has changed. We'll drop the fact that the Holy Synod was later transformed by Stalin into the patriarchy we know today, and dive into the essence of the relationship of Russians to Orthodoxy. Back in June 26, 2006, I published an article in the Commerçant Vlast newspaper where I uncovered the fact that there was an icon being sold in all church shops with the image of St. George the Victorious that was actually an image of Napoleon Bonaparte. I was sure that in six years the incident was settled, Nothing of the sort. When I recently answered Patriarch Kirill's, or Mr. Gundayev's, epistle on the Patriotic War of 1812, I mentioned this situation again and thought that it was finally settled. No. My friends in Facebook instantly messaged me that it was still being sold. I asked them to visit one of the shops, and last Friday they brought me this icon. Here it is. But first, let's figure out the origin of this wonderful little icon. Here I have the Soviet edition of an excellent book about the French artist Jacques-Louis David. Louis David was a great artist with passion for antiquity. He was the one who single-handedly directed all the celebrations and festivities in atheistic revolutionary France. And so, let's take a look and compare the two. Where should I show the icon? Ah, here, take it. It's pure orthodoxy. Hold tight or the State Department will get it. And I'll take Louis David. Look, we see Hessian boots, the horse, the revolutionary general's cloak, everything. 
watch. Maybe just as the patriarchs photoshopped watch, they removed Napoleon's hat, added some small clouds, and added some creature. There it is. And that's all. Did you get that on camera? And so, compare this with Louis David's Napoleon crossing the Alps. Now, please return the icon to its rightful owner. Private property, after all. So, as you know, an icon can't be signed, so unfortunately we'll never know the craftsman responsible for this. But, if we look on the back, we'll see the logo Sofrino. And some people say, I'm not sure if this is true, that Sofrino is a monopolist in the production of everything considered Orthodox Christian. So these are the people who make money off Napoleon and who build a business on the names of Napoleon and Christ. If only Christ and Napoleon knew what would be done to their ideas and histories by people who passed through the millstones of communism. By the way, as we speak, just across the road from us, there's an honorary prayer going on, and I'm sure something similar to this icon could be there. And nothing has changed in six years. And all of this costs money. I don't mind spending money on Napoleon, a great man after all, not to mention St. George the Victorious. And so, we continue our dive into the atmosphere of the era. Through what prism do we all see the Patriotic War of 1812? First of all, through the military gallery of the Winter Palace, right? Generals, heroes, and the whole lot. It's an excellent metaphor. My firm belief is that history should be understood through metaphors. Just listen. The military gallery of the Winter Palace. They are all in the Winter Palace. And as we know, Winter compensated for their lack of military talent because they lost Borodino, left Smolensk and Moscow, lost Mala Yaroslavets, and then Winter set in. So, the Winter Palace. As you know, the Winter Palace was built by Rostrelli, not a Russian architect. And as a famous Russian satirist joked, the architect was Rastrelin, a play of words meaning the architect was shot. The Winter Palace was built by Rastrelli in a city with a German name on a territory previously belonging to the Chukha people, St. Petersburg, the capital of the Russian Empire. Moving on. Who painted all those marvelous Russian portraits? I'll skip the fact that most of them were drawn post-mortem. What matters is their heroic appearance. They were all painted by George Doe. So, who painted the history of our patriotic war? An Englishman. Who benefited most from a war between France and Russia? Who ordered the murder of Pavel I? England. It's all a metaphor. History is full of them. What other prisms do we use when looking at the War of 1812? We don't use documents, no. We use novels, fiction, which by definition have nothing to do with the historical truth. What's more, we view history not only through these novels, but through the incorrect school interpretations of these novels, as well as through the relatively accurate depiction of them in cinema. But returning, returning to the question of how the French found themselves on Russian territory, though the truth is they were not exactly on Russian territory, because when they crossed the Neiman River, they did invade, but they invaded territory recently occupied by the Russian Empire, which was formerly the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. That's why the Lithuanians instantly switched to Napoleon's side, providing more than 20,000 men. So, how did they get there? As I had mentioned earlier, there was the Great French Revolution. That was when the French decided that they were going to live in a new way. Here we need to read a very important document, an essential document of the age, consequently having much to do with today's Russia. It was published on August 26, 1789, not in Russia. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. Article 1. Men are born and remain free and equal in rights. Social distinctions may be founded only upon the general good." And so on. As you understand, 
Not everybody was satisfied with such an idea. In some countries, rulers are still very much against it, and that's where many of today's problems come from. TV Rain knows exactly what I'm talking about, of course. So, not everyone liked these new ideas. And so we have anti-French coalitions, the purpose of which were to intervene and change France's political regime. They began in 1791 and ended in 1815. The goal was reached. The year 1812, located almost in the middle, was an organic part of these coalitions. However, there is one important nuance. After the second anti-French coalition, the human and economic resources of European feudal monarchies like Prussia and Austria were exhausted. England was the one who sponsored the war because it was profitable for European cannon fodder and blood to be shed instead of English blood, all thanks to English money. So England could continue sponsoring this war, but as I've already said, there were little resources left. Powell I understood this, and so the war ended and peace was established. Napoleon returned and clothed 7,000 captive Russian officers and soldiers without compensation and just sent them back to Russia. However, after the murder of Pavel I, an action sponsored by England, Alexander I stepped onto the throne. Let's talk about this for a moment. They say Napoleon, the enemy, was an illegitimate ruler. That, my friends, is a double standard. Who was really illegitimate? Throughout the whole 18th century, there were a series of palace coups in Russia. Not a single legitimate monarch, including Catherine the Great, who had her own coup. Alexander I was not an exception. How did Napoleon become the emperor? Easily. On May 18th, 1804, the Senate, or Senatus Consultum, declared him the emperor. However, Napoleon declined and offered to conduct an election. A general election was held and without any fraud or hacking, only 0.0003% of the population was against him. Why? Because in the years of his consulate, Mr. Bonaparte was able to reform and revive France. It became a completely different state. He created the Civil Codex and the National Bank, managed the budget deficit, built roads, pacified all the political parties. He was what you can call a founding father, not by means of words or ideology, but by deeds. And he was legally elected, which means he was first declared emperor by the Senate, then elected by the people, and then anointed by the Pope. Okay, now we need a commercial break. Is there anything Orthodox Christian there? We'll see. Lectures on the Rain. This is Lectures on the Rain, and we are still trying to figure out what victory in the Patriotic War of 1812 is now being celebrated near the Cathedral of Christ the Savior, Evgeny Ponosenkov. And so I continue. Napoleon had all the rights to be emperor, from the people, the Senate, historically, and even from the Pope. Alexander I came to power as a result of parricide. Well, all right, so he killed his father. Not the most orthodox thing to do, but all right. He could have at least done something important for the country. He, of course, wanted to. He wanted to. As one of our celebrity supporters of Putin recently said about him, he's trying. Not everything goes as planned, but he's trying. Alexander also tried, and nothing turned out well. It all ended with the Arakcheyev regime and the Decembrists. The Decembrists also failed to change the situation. Alexander I did not succeed in carrying out any reforms in Russia. That's one of the reasons why he was called a weak and sly ruler. That's why he was epitomized in one of Gogol's most famous characters, Manilov. Alexander I was indeed very cutesy, a genuine Manilov. He adored French songs, but he didn't sing them, but rather whistled them. He was always whistling. He was what you would call a professional whistler. For this talent, he was despised in the army and therefore he didn't like male company. He often visited women's salons because they would accompany him on piano. He did this even when listening to reports from his advisors and senators, including those like Spiransky, who resentfully wrote, I'm reading him a report and he's over there by the window whistling a song. And so he whistled through the War of 1812. So when Napoleon crossed the Neiman River, 
By the way, Alexander was with the army as early as April when Napoleon was still in Paris. So Napoleon crossed when Alexander was still attending a ball in Vilnius, and then Alexander left for St. Petersburg. I emphasize he left bravely. I've given this much thought and come to the following conclusion as to why. You know, from afar, to a true military leader, the panorama of war is, strategically speaking, more visible, and Alexander I, being an Orthodox Christian, should have had an incredible sense of vision. Because what could Napoleon see from where he was? Nothing, of course. And so Alexander leaves. But let's return to our question. How did the French appear at Russia's borders? In 1805, Alexander I created the Third Anti-French Coalition and sent Russian people across all of Europe through Austria on a military intervention into France. If we look at the War of 1812 through the prism of the events of 1941, which is in essence wrong, but excuse me, then Alexander had played the role of Hitler twice, in 1805 and in 1807. In 1805, he was driven to the banks of the Danube River. His allies, the Austrians, gave up Vienna, and then, near Austerlitz, the Russian forces, who were under the command of General Kutuzov, were defeated. Kutuzov had two great battles. One was Auschwitz and the other Borodino. Both were lost, considered a great man. Alexander I was unsettled. I remind you that Napoleon wanted peace and did not pursue the defeated Russian army. Alexander would not agree on peace. In 1806, the Orthodox Emperor once again goes on a military intervention into France, this time with Prussia as its ally, because Austria had been defeated. But then, Napoleon quickly defeats Prussia, beats the Russians, and then, as you know, there was Friedland and the peace in Tilsit. Note that 1806 is a critical year. It was that year that the People's Militia was created, not for the protection of Mother Russia, or even the territories now part of her domain, I mean former Poland and so on. No, it was created for another military intervention into France. Here, Alexander I made a grave mistake. He did not return these militiamen back to their masters, the landowners. He forced them into conscription. That's how he first set himself up, after which in 1812, landowners would send only the sick and crippled to war. In 1806, Alexander I declared anathema to the Catholic Napoleon. Very effective. Despite that, in 1807, the Orthodox Emperor, after being twice defeated, was forced to kiss the declared Antichrist Napoleon in Tilsit. What's more, he presented him with the Order of Saint Andrew, the Apostle I called. For those of you who don't know, that's the highest existing order in the Russian Empire. Its motto, for faith and loyalty. Orthodoxy. Napoleon had Tilsit. He writes home to Paris, finally, Russia is our ally, something he had dreamt about since the times of Emperor Pavel. Nothing of the sort. Alexander, on the other hand, writes to his mother, we don't need a break. He begins to summon a new army. In 1808, the first peaceful year, he increases the military budget from 63,750,000 rubles in 1807 to 118,500,000 rubles in 1808. That's almost two times, a double increase. And logically, what happens? A financial crisis. You know, before, many have connected this crisis with Russia's joining the continental blockade. This is entirely false, because Alexander joined the continental blockade only by the end of 1808, when Colin Coeur and Napoleon had already requested him to do so a dozen times. What's more, English goods instantly began to be imported under a neutral flag, which meant no evident reduction in trade. On the other hand, even before my statistical research in 2001, much earlier, on December 8, 1808, Rumantsev, the chancellor of the Russian Empire, in his report to the Tsar, writes, Our current economic problems are not from joining the continental blockade, but from increased military spending. Because official losses from customs were 3.6 million, compare that to the increase in 50 million. Statistics and facts are stubborn things. In short, in 1810, three Russian armies were standing on the border. On October 27th and 29th of 1811, Emperor Alexander orders to move further into Europe and wage war with the French. But he was counting on Prussia, 
a convention was signed. However, the Prussian king, after his previous venture against Napoleon in 1806, was scared, and that put Alexander I in a foolish position. His army was already deployed in battle order. Napoleon was provoked and was gathering his troops, starting later than Alexander. What was he to do? There was only one thing left to do. At the expense of Russian lives, at the expense of great material losses, wage a war of retreat. The idea was suggested not only by Barclay de Tolly. Alexander I was finally convinced by a man from abroad, we tend to trust those from overseas, Jean Bernadotte, a former marshal of Napoleon and Swedish crown prince, who said, you haven't the talent to fight Napoleon, retreat and use your large territory. And so we retreated until winter set in. And as you see, only we can be in such a situation. First, we prepare to attack, but when Napoleon suddenly advances, two of our three armies, all of which were not connected, begin to retreat in order to unite. The Russian historians have written, a brilliant retreat in order to unite. Why didn't you unite two years earlier? That's the question I ask. We started preparing prior to everyone else, but were, as usual, not ready in time for war. Napoleon crossed the Neiman River while Alexander was still at a ball. It's a famous story. He's dancing at a ball. He gets a report. Napoleon is crossed. He says, it's fine. Let's finish the ball. He won't advance as fast. Napoleon, of course, advances. Alexander I, of course, flees to St. Petersburg. Actually, his staff advised him to leave. But it was his sister who finally persuaded him, because like a real man, he listened to his sister. So he leaves. Barclay retreats and gets all the blame. Alexander too. A plot is brewing in St. Petersburg because landowners are losing their estates. Alexander does a very clever thing. Some Byzantine spirit in him after all. He appoints Kutuzov, who was a bad general, but was a very educated man and knew many languages and was a brilliant military engineer. But Kutuzov was a landowner, one of their own. So then blame one of your own. 5,567 serfs. One of their class. Everything's fine. You can't do anything to him. On Russia's population, as you know, Russia was a solely agricultural country. The vast majority of the population were peasants and most of the peasants were serfs. Of course, there was no patriotic war because serfs don't really have any true understanding of patriotism. Geographically, they knew nothing of their motherland because they never went beyond their own village. What's more, they didn't even have their own village because, as you may know, they were often sold without a family or land, so they often didn't know where they came from. For them, their owners were those who came and bought them today. So when Napoleon approached Moscow and entered, most Uyas around Moscow declared their loyalty to Napoleon. We are now Napoleons, they said. That's why Napoleon was able to enter Moscow, why he was able to stay there for 36 days and nobody, neither the Russian army nor the peasants, tried to throw out their adversary. Uh, how did the Orthodox Christian landowners treat their peasants? Here's an example from an ad in the paper Moskovsky Vedomosti. For sale, a well-bred bitch, if she's well-bred I can say it, and a broad named Peraska who can sew. So they sold a well-bred bitch with an Orthodox Christian broad named Peraska. How did the Orthodox Christian priests treat the peasants? As you know, historically, the Russian church was always one of the main feudal powers. Only Catherine the Great, not the Bolsheviks, but the enlightened Catherine the Great, conducted the so-called secularization of church lands. In other words, a withdrawal of lands from the monstrous being called the Russian Orthodox Church. And, as you understand, who was considered a serf? Only males were considered as souls. Women were not even considered as souls. We don't even know the true population of Russia in 1812. Scholars say somewhere around 40 million. It's impossible to count because women, peasants, were not accounted for. They were not even souls. I see a few women in our audience. Remember, in 1812, you were not even souls from the standpoint of the Orthodox Church as well. And so, what unification or patriotism, a wonderful Latin word, can we talk about? Maybe the nobility. Maybe the nobility were patriots. Yes. They were terrific patriots. They spoke predominantly French, lived mainly abroad. Everything they drank, ate, dressed up in, read, everything was French. And when I'm asked, what is war? I say that it's a loss of independence and what's more, a loss of your way of life. I don't want the invader to change my way of life. 
but they were already living the French life. And of course, Napoleon didn't want to conquer us. Even the most ardent hooray patriots admit to that. He only needed peace with Alexander. One more brilliant detail. They say the Napoleonic Ords. I always ask for facts, for documents. Don't use big words, they always lie. As the Russian writer Saltikov Shadrin said, they're starting the stress patriotism. No doubt they've got their hand in the till. And one more genius quote by August Strindberg. When the state begins to kill its citizens, it always calls itself a homeland. So how were things really? You know, when entering Russia, Napoleon, in his first echelon, introduced 413,000 troops. The number varied from 390,000 and up. They went to their garrisons, different wings, from Riga to the very south, and so on. But Russian officers believed that the so-called primordial Russian land started after Smolensk, and everything before it was former Poland. That's why Poland sided with Napoleon, celebrated the Russian defeat at Borodino, and so on. So, when Napoleon had entered Russian territory, after Smolensk, he had only 125,000 soldiers remaining. Forgive me, but 125,000 soldiers is no more than two meetings on the Bolotnaya Square. I have a question. Where was all this great Russian nation that would just disperse this Bolotny meeting? I mean, 160,000 French. Where was Kourguignan? Where was our Russian patriots in 1812? I know where the modern-day Bagration Svanidze was. Note that all these Napoleonic ords could fit on one Russian field. One Russian field. You know, what a good song that was. Words by Inna Goff, music by Jan Frankel, performed by Josef Kobzon, a beautiful song called Russian Field. So, they all fit. Okay, let's say the villagers can't fight a trained and armed army. Why did the professional Russian army, under the command of brilliant Kutuzov, lose the Battle of Borodino? Why did they leave Moscow? The Russians had around 100,000 soldiers near Moscow, in addition to the population of 251,000, not to mention the city walls and the Kremlin. Napoleon had 93,000. Why didn't anyone stand up and defend the capital, the place of their father's graves, the graves of the princes and saints? Why? Apparently because neither the nobility nor the serfs felt their connection with the so-called trilogy of Uvarov and Binkendorf. With this gentleman set of Uvarov and Binkendorf. I mean orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality. They didn't even read the papers. There were actual problems with that. The Journal of Son of Fatherland, Sino Chichistva, was published in several hundred copies at the end of 1812 by direct order of Uvarov. And who was Uvarov? So, now we're approaching a very important question. I think we need to mention a few very important things about the Battle of Borodino. First of all, the balance of forces. This is usually a dark forest. We pretty much know the numbers, but the calculations and discussions on the topic is something I urge you to stay away from. We don't even have time or energy for this. I'll just try and give you a general picture. According to the registers of September 1st to September 3rd of 1812 in the new calendar, the French army had 133,819 soldiers. Next, scholars understand that you need to add the Corps of La Tour Mubur, General Pajol's division. Add all that, and from that, subtract the daily losses in maneuvering, losses in rearguard and avant-garde skirmishes, subtract the casualties from the Battle of the Chevardin Redoute on August 24th, just before Borodino. As a result of all of these horrific calculations, we get an estimated 125,000 soldiers. I often round up to 135. Why? They often accuse me of being unpatriotic, so I'll round up. More French. Now, as for the Russians, everything is also well known, but a dark forest in terms of calculations. We have registers from the 24th and 25th of August, roll call of the soldiers and so on, but from these numbers we need to subtract the losses from the Battle of the Shivardin Redoute. Then there are some who count the Cossacks as part of the regular army, and those who don't, because the Cossacks were indeed part of the irregular army. They had a very well-trained light cavalry equal to that of the French. The same skill level. Quite another matter was when they were not in battle, they would often raid Russian villages. 
But that's a whole different story. The militia. The Moscow militia had 22,000. The Smolensk militia had 10,000. The Cossacks, under command of Ataman Matvey Plotov, had 11,000. And the Russian regular army, according to different estimates, with the recount and rounding of the registers, was at 115,320 people without around 110,000. All in all, the Russian army had about 155,200 soldiers. And I want to emphasize, these were all Orthodox Christians. And one Orthodox Christian defending his homeland can be counted as 10. Well, if we do hear such things in today's honorary prayer, I can only follow along. All right. What if we count it this way? Take into account that from his 125,000 soldiers, Napoleon did not use his Imperial Guard. According to the register from September 2nd, the Imperial Guard had 18,862 people, plus 3,000 in the main headquarters, minus 1,500 in the Imperial Artillery Unit, that didn't really participate but took shots and also suffered minimum casualties. Of course, the Imperial Guard should be counted like Orthodox soldiers, because they were specially selected and they were worth much more than 20,000. But why did this happen? Why did the Russians, who had more soldiers, who were in a fortified positions... Yes, Kutuzov was in a fortified position when the French were advancing. According to military rules of the time, the advancing army should have one-third more soldiers than its opponent, and they had less. So why did Kutuzov lose all the fortified positions at Borodino? Daryevsky Battery, also known as the Kurgan Heights, the Bregretion Fleshes, Utitsky Kurgan... Why were they lost? Why did the Russians retreat? Why did they retreat in such a way that they gave up Moscow and left all the way to Tarutino? Why? Because, of course, the battle was lost. In a fortified position, the Russian forces managed to lose more than the French. The French army managed to lose approximately 22,000 soldiers, while the Russian army lost around 53,000 soldiers. You know why? The answer is quite clear. The great warlord Kutuzov was at the head of all this. How did he conduct his reconnaissance before the battle? In Droshki, a low four-wheeled open carriage which could not pass everywhere. He didn't even get on a horse. And how did Napoleon conduct his reconnaissance? He was on horseback. He managed to study the Russian position so closely that he was even shot at, approaching his enemies almost as close as I am here with you. Kutuzov, according to some very cunning plan of his, arranged his army approximately like this. Do you see my hand? Here were the French. The Russians were here, but they were also here. The whole right flank was lined up against God knows who. There were no French there. As a result, already during the battle when Napoleon was attacking and destroying Bagration's army, also known as the Second Army, which was almost completely obliterated, Kutuzov realized this and started maneuvering his soldiers toward Bagration right under enemy fire. But it was already too late. Bagration's fleshes had already fallen. An important detail. We often hear, and many literary sources say, that Bagration fleshes fell around midday. That's a lie. They fell at 9 o'clock in the morning, for a very simple reason. Even in monographs, where serious researchers studied the subject matter, everyone noted that Yermolov and all the other memoirists write, the Bagration fleshes fell at 9 o'clock. Very fast. After that, they write, they fell at 12 o'clock. Why? because they don't even think about what they're writing. In the official report to Kutuzov, and later in the description made by Karl Toll, a very important man who was the quartermaster general and responsible for stationing the troops, it says 12 o'clock. Why did Toll lie? He was trying to hide the fatal positioning of the Russian army for which he and Kutuzov were responsible. But today, thanks to researchers, we know that they fell a lot faster. So. One more significant moment. We say, they showed the miracles of heroism at Borodino. I agree. But I have a question. If there were miracles of heroism, if the Russians had greater amounts of troops, even if they had less, why did they leave the battlefield? So it turns out that the French, who by definition were not patriots at Borodino, had more patriotism in them, if we equate patriotism and heroism. Although we remember how Bagration exclaimed bravo to the French who passed right in front of the Russian case shots 300 meters before the fleshes, we remember one of the greatest attacks in world history, that of the cuirassiers led by Auguste Collincourt, brother of Armand de Collincourt, the former French ambassador to Russia, who burst onto the Rayevsky battery and died. 
Auguste died, his act of bravery was later glorified by Victor Hugo, and Russian generals wrote about him with admiration. So it turns out the French were a bit more encouraged. Although I still don't understand, returning to the topic of the honorary prayer. Because before the battle, Kutuzov carried an icon of the Smolensk Hodegitria icon of Theotokos, also known as She Who Leads the Way, which was evacuated from Smolensk. It didn't help them back in Smolensk, and it didn't help them before Borodino, despite the theatricality. The French army, on the other hand, had no priests. It was an atheistic army, a terrible atheistic army which fought very well. The only thing Napoleon did, and this wasn't on purpose, was put out a portrait of his 20-month son in front of his tent, something delivered to him a day before the battle. So we can compare. I don't think the picture frame, oil and canvas somehow influenced the French soldiers, but it was a French victory. Of course, Kutuzov didn't have such a wonderful icon. Although Jean-Louis David had already drawn a similar picture, the icon didn't exist yet. Maybe he could have carried this one. And so, the Russians lose Borodino, they leave Moscow with greater losses than the French. No one bothers Napoleon in Moscow. If he would have had food, he could have been there until the Gorbachev thaw. But as Napoleon was leaving Moscow, all of a sudden, peasants from the neighboring villages began to loot the city. Why did they do that? because they despised the rich Muscovites. Just like today, patriotism was at its highest. Okay, let's not mind the peasants. What about the enlightened nobility? The nobles living at the time, not unlike today when you're being lied for your own money on state-owned TV channels, back then they understood who was to blame for the war. Alexander I, who had already led the Russian towards France several times, was to blame. So after the War of 1812, something wonderful began. The government finally decided to make amends for its wrongdoings and allowed to apply for compensation for the damage caused by the war. And now we read what the nobles, Orthodox aristocrats, pleaded Emperor Alexander and Mother Russia to compensate them for. <laughs> This is really fun. And so, the following pleads were made. The claim of Count Golovin. He asked for 229,000 rubles, an immense sum of money. Count Tolstoy asked for 200,000, Prince Trubetskoy about the same sum. But what follows is even better. In the claim of Prince Zasekin, researchers found four jugs for cream, two oil cans and a broth cup. The daughter of noble brigadier Artamonov went a step further. She requested new stockings and frills, all words of a foreign origin. The number of claims was so great that Alexander I quickly stopped this endeavor. He very soon refused to compensate everyone, especially since the investigations revealed that it wasn't the French that had stolen all the stockings and broth cups, it was their own peasants. What's most important? We call the War of 1812 patriotic, a war for the motherland. On the contrary, it was one of Napoleon's local campaigns. He simply couldn't wait any longer. All he needed was a borderline battle and peace with Alexander. He had already started the campaign too late. Nobody goes to war in June, because if you want to conduct an invasion, soon you'll have fall, rains and so on. Plus, Napoleon still had Prussia and Austria in his rear. And if he had carried on this way, Prussia and Russia, who had already signed a secret agreement with Russia, would begin to advance, as they eventually did the next year. The Sixth Anti-French Coalition already existed in 1812, consisting of England, Sweden, and so on. The Russians fought with English rifles. And who paid the bill? Here's another important detail, and not many like to mention it. Starting in 1805, for every 100,000 Russian and coalition soldiers, England paid 1,250,000 British pounds. For a feudal country and a Tsar who couldn't make any money, it was a serious sum, I assure you. Almost 8 million rubles, as recalculated by Professor Nikolai Troitsky. So, I repeat, it looked more like one of Napoleon's local campaigns, because Russia was an enormous country. For those of you patriots who have never been beyond Moscow Ring or Paris, it's a giant country. I checked the map. This military campaign spread from former Poland and Polish territories to Moscow in a thin, thin line that spread out over the entire length of the old Smolensk Road. There were no other roads. On the other hand, the peasant war against the nobility and the Tsar going on at the same time covered 
32 regions. The amount of territory is incomparable. So, there were two wars, a Russian civil war, de facto, and Napoleon's local campaign. Years later, this was converted into the story we have today. Emperor Alexander and the nobility understood that there's nothing worse than arming peasants. Peasants were already picking up arms left by the Russian and French soldiers. Alexander knew this, and at the end of 1812, he ordered all arms to be given to the Orthodox Church, thereby insulting Christianity, because weapons and church. And so he disarmed the peasants. As I've already mentioned, the peasants of 1812 weren't what you'd call true patriots the nobles and priests as well. In a special reply to Patriarch Kirill in my monograph, which can all be found on the internet, I explained how many Orthodox priests, not those from St. Petersburg, but those on territories occupied by Napoleon, naturally sided with Napoleon, as they later did with Hitler, and as they did before with the Golden Ord. They even included Napoleon in Our Father Who Art in Heaven, even though back in St. Petersburg, they once again declared anathema to a Catholic Napoleon, now for the second time, after already presenting him with the Order of St. Andrew the Apostle the First called. So it's a great tragedy, but at the same time, it's an even bigger farce, a horrific, tragical farce. When did the war become patriotic? On its anniversary. Tsar Nikolai I, also known as Nikolai Palkin, said it should be called patriotic and ordered to write a four-volume edition written by Alexander Mikhailovsky Danilevsky, who himself was a military censor. However, Tsar Nikolai didn't trust him and edited the work himself, completely throwing out the first chapter where the reasons for the war were explained. Though Mikhailovsky Danilevsky tried hard to hide the blame of Emperor Alexander, even his censorship talent couldn't help. And so the war just began. One last important detail. When we talk about the retreat of the Russian army, we must keep in mind simple numbers that are hard to argue with. The distance from Vilnius to Moscow is 900 kilometers. This distance was covered, and you can count, from June 24th to September 14th, when the French entered Moscow. That's a total of 11 kilometers a day. In a standard situation with a small army and good roads, you can cover even more. But if you include battles, maneuvers, the protection of the fatherland, imagine how fast the Russians needed to protect Russia in order to retreat 11 kilometers a day. That includes infantry, cannons, ammunition, stores and produce, everything. And so fast. You can't argue with that. We also can't argue with an occasional commercial break. Lectures on the rain. We continue our lecture approaching the second and final part of our ballet. And so, an essential question about the outcome of the war. Who won and who lost? They say the French army suffered immense, catastrophic losses. True, but that was not in battle. Only when the frost and hunger set in. The Russian army sustained the same casualties in the same exact period, also not in battle. General Kutuzov led 130,000 men out of Terutino. By the time he was in Vilnius, he had 27,000. 90% of the losses were non-combat. As you know, Kutuzov followed Napoleon in the so-called parallel march, a term used by our pseudo-patriotic historians. He did not engage in any serious battles. Of course, he had already lost two times. The Russian army disintegrated for the same reasons that the French army did. The Winter Palace was to blame. Russia is a giant winter palace. It was cold and therefore there was nothing to eat. Back in Tarutino, Kutuzov failed to organize winter clothes and food for his army. Generals and memorists despised him and accused him of treason. What was Kutuzov really doing in Tarutino? He had a 14-year-old girl dressed as a Cossack, something he started back in Turkey. It's all documented and digitalized. You can find it online. So today, when we erect a monument to Kutuzov, even though the law does not have a retroactive effect, we're building a monument to a malignant and recessive pedophile. And so Napoleon leaves Russia. Both Russian and French armies are obliterated. Whose victory is it? Well, it was a French military victory, because all battles were won by the French. Undoubtedly a political and economic victory of England, because Britain was the only one who profited from this war. So who lost? The peasants, their cottages destroyed, 
crops burnt, a lot of civilian casualties. The nobles lost. Don't forget their claims and the fact that they lost entire estates. Moscow was burnt to the ground, while Alexander I whistled in St. Petersburg. Like I said, he was a professional whistler. The merchants also lost because there was no possible trade. In this regard, the Russians lost. Only England won, and that's why George Doe drew the portraits of the Russian military generals, many of them after their deaths. What is the historical meaning of the war? Prussia increased its strength because Alexander I was on its side. As a result, we got two world wars. Our allies betrayed us, and the Crimean War really showed us who was on Russia's side. As you all know, today, Lithuania, where Napoleon first crossed into Russia, and the other bordering countries are part of the European Union. A single currency, single government, something Napoleon thought of all along. As you can remember, he was always fighting off anti-French coalitions, which meant countries were attacking France. So he was actually thinking about things like that. Let's not forget the abolition of serfdom in Poland, something he could have done in Russia. But his main goal was peace with Alexander. Had this been achieved, the results would have been completely different. Unfortunately, he didn't. So those are the results of the war. The economic and political victory of England. The defeat of all layers of the Russian strata. The military victory of the French. And that's what we celebrate today. Emperor Alexander once used the resources of the Russian people, just like today, the celebration budget is somewhere around 2,400,000 rubles which I'm not sure of because the Moscow budget is even greater. All paid for by you. So, we found out many new things about the Battle of Borodino. It's something worth really thinking about, worth reading the sources and diving into the history to understand if today's lecture was right or wrong. The decision's up to you. I, for one, thought about this. When Vladimir Putin in his inaugural address exclaimed, let's die for Moscow now just as our brothers died before us, what did he mean by that? Judging by this lecture, it's unclear. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this lecture and want to find out more, please check out the link below for a copy of Yevgeny Ponosenkov's recent monumental monograph, The First Scientific History of the War of 1812. 20 archives from Europe and Russia, more than 4,000 scientific citations, a brand new view on the Napoleonic era. Translated and recorded by Daniel Medvedev at Rexquare Studios, Moscow.